You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. I have Gannon Sims. He is the author of a book called Bringing Church Home. Uh, he's a senior pastor and a lead missionary. So we're going to talk about his work with the church and his book and uh, any other issues that come up. So again, and thank you for coming. Richard, it's great to be here. Thanks. If you would, tell me a bit about your, your background. Um, have you always you know, been of the Christian faith or did you come to faith at a particular moment? And you know, what was that story like, if you don't mind sharing? Oh, thanks for the question. I uh, was privileged to be raised within a caring community, within a Christian home and a, a church community that uh, nurtured me in the faith. And, you know, as, as we grow and we mature, the faith becomes our own. I mean, there, there were a number of markers along the way, sort of a, a, a coming to faith on my own, first as an 11-year-old. Um, I was baptized into the faith as an 11-year-old. And, but then, you know, over over years, you uh, begin discovering more and more parts of yourself that aren't uh, fully, uh, like I, we say, handed over to uh, the Lordship of Jesus. And mm. you know, when those things are identified in our life, those things are sort of handed over. And, and I, there's, there's more and more peace in our interior life when, when that does happen. So, you know, a number of, of different markers um, in, in my 20s as a, a kind of a university student and, and just out of university, you know, just sort of um, aware of some of my own ambitions and, and how those may or may not have been consistent with, uh, you know, core uh, Christian convictions. And, and then, you know, finally, sort of a, um, we, we use a terminology, Richard, of sort of um, letting go or surrendering to a fuller uh, Christian vocation. And, and so I, you know, I, I sort of embarked upon this journey of um, a deeper Christian call. I, I am a firm believer that we live out our Christian calling in all aspects of our life and in, in all vocations, whether that's a career vocation or the vocation of marriage or parenthood. Um, but some of us are called to uh, service and ministry in the life of the church. So that's where I find myself. And it's, a, mm. it's an odd and wondrous calling, but it's a, a, a beautiful, a beautiful thing. Yeah, I hope it's not too personal, but what does the calling, how does it manifest for you? Is it, a, is it an urge, a feeling? Was it words? Was it a dream? You know, how, how did it come to you? It's a great question. The, the calling for me emerged over... A number of years, really, uh, first as a teenager, kind of recognizing I enjoyed, um, I, I enjoy, I mean, maybe what I, what we, what we might call the contemplative life. So a life of, of a quiet reflection. Um, at the same time, I enjoyed and, and seemed to be thrust into uh, positions of leadership, uh, lead this, teach this, gather people for this. And so it was this kind of um, interesting dichotomy between the inner life and then the kind of that lived um, an outward way. And so it was a call that sort of was nurtured in me from a, you know, from about the age of 15. I, I will say that, you know, in, in the life of church, and there are a lot of folks who would call themselves maybe de-churched or kind of allergic to church. There's, there is a, in many respects, uh, sometimes a great level of inconsistency with some in Christian leadership. We read about uh, the inconsistency of Christian leaders in, in the news all too frequently. And those uh, news reports of inconsistencies of, of the application of faith and, and the abuse of faith even um, sort of uh, enabled me in, in some uh, way to kind of pause and carefully consider this calling over a number of years to the point where I finally, um, somebody said, well, you can't do anything else. 
you know it's really a call. And, and so uh, to be, to kind of receive a call is to be attuned to the caller and they're just, you know, things inside of me and um, that I sort of saw manifesting through the various gifts and graces of, of leadership that um, kind of enable me to kind of follow this call. And I, I will I will say I'm kind of a reluctant uh, minister in, in many ways. Um, so what I don't do you mean? Do it. What do you mean reluctant ministrant? Uh, a reluctant minister because I don't want to be um, an authoritarian minister or a, a, a dictatorial one or an inconsistent one or one who is lacking in, in character or wisdom. And so, you know, I think it's, it's uh, um, you know, my obedience to the call is, is tempered uh, by kind of a constant awareness and asking myself questions of, okay, am I, am I the same person uh, talking with you on a podcast as I am uh, washing dishes <laughs> at home? Uh, I want those things to be uh, consistent. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, what, what's, your, what's your current work look like today? What are you working on actively? What kind of projects? Thanks. I've um, for 11 years been a founding director of uh, the U.S. Fresh Expressions team. And Fresh Expressions is a, a mission movement uh, for Christian mission uh, that uh, originated with the Church of England um, and kind of has found its home in a number of different uh, churches and uh, Christian traditions around the world. So Fresh Expressions is really designed to uh, help churches that are in decline and think about new life. And often we find new life outside the walls of the church. There are people who are predisposed to coming to church on Sunday mornings, but there are many more who are lonely and depressed and looking for community and uh, don't know that that kind of love and community can be found within a Christian community. And so um, helping and training church leaders to think outside the box, to think outside the walls of the church has been something I've been a, a doing for, for some time. And uh, just a, a few months ago, I received a call to a 124-year-old uh, urban congregation in Dallas, Texas, a church called Cliff Temple Baptist Church. And a Cliff Temple is the kind of church that has been living into this kind of new way of thinking about mission for really a long time. Um, they've um, courageously served their neighborhood when a number of other churches moved out of the neighborhood. The neighborhood got hard. Um, so this church stayed in the neighborhood, has remained faithful to their call, and has a lot of uh, sort of creative things. So we um, every day serve the homeless. Uh, several days a week, we host uh, community art gatherings where we have, we have a maker space in, in our church building where people are, are making pottery and, and other types of visual art. We have an art gallery. We have a really uh, active uh, group of teenagers that on any even Wednesday night might be seen, you know, walking around, um, getting to know local business owners as they did on Wednesday night, um, finding out a, about their life stories, finding out about, you know, the history of the neighborhood reflected in the business community. Um, not a typical maybe activity for, for a bunch of 14, 15, 16 year olds, but that's sort of what uh, they like to do. And then we have a, a, a wonderful Sunday congregation where we, we, we worship, we sing, we pray, we um, I hear, hear uh, scripture read, and so it's a, a, a beautiful reflection of the kingdom of God in the Oak Cliff neighborhood. Of yeah, what do you observe about um, the churches in which you've been a part of? That I would guess that, you know, some people only come once a week, maybe on Sunday. Some people are active every day. Some people maybe once every few months. What, uh, what does it look like to you, and, and how do you work with the different groups that will show up, you know, for different periods of time? Uh, all of the above. We see people who are around, as you said, um, several days a week. We see people who are just there on Sunday mornings. We see, you know, statistically now, um, church attendance, it, what was, what's considered to be regular church attendance is really monthly attendance. So many people have uh, lifestyles where they are uh, visiting family uh, on, on weekends. They're taking their children to travel soccer on the weekends. All these, these, these different kinds of things competing for that Sunday morning time. And that's, you know, I think we can either wring our hands or we can say, okay, this is just a, this is a fact of life. Um, how are we equipping and training 
people to be faithful uh, Christians uh, every day of the week. And so, you know, this is that's why I love podcasts. Our church uh, just started a podcast um, as a way to sort of uh, get people as they go. And there's there's lots of other kind of ways of reaching people other than just sort of the central the central weekly. Well, who do you find is willing to come on the days other than Sunday and participate in some of these activities? Like you mentioned, teenagers, I guess, meeting business owners in the community and learning from them. These other projects, I don't know what you call them besides just more Sunday service. And how do you recruit for them? Who does them? Why? Well, they, they do them because they feel called to do them. And they do them because they, they love serving people. They love uh, the work of the church. They love doing it together. They love doing it in community. I mean, people are looking for uh, worth and meaning. And, you know, the church has that to offer through the, the life and uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. And so uh, getting to be a part of uh, what Jesus tells us is, you know, the renewal of all things um, is this really great adventure that we get to be on. So I'm just, I'm in my mind's eye, I'm seeing the, you know, the, the faces of the teenagers after they uh, were out on, on Wednesday night meeting people and, and they were, they were um, handing out flyers. Our, our homeless mission is, is participating in uh, the North Texas Day of Giving, and a lot of communities around the country have a have a, a charitable giving day where we're trying to concentrate efforts there. And and so you know the kids are are proud to share. Hey, our church uh, serves you know between fifty and sixty uh, folks experiencing food insecurity every single day, and we and it's a it's a huge community uh, benefit partner. And so um, to get to tell people about that gives them meaning, but it also gives kind of a, a reason to kind of think about the church. Um, Maybe in a way that they haven't thought about church before. A lot of people think, okay, yeah, church, that people do on Sundays and it's arcane, but they understand uh, hungry people. Yeah, how, how are you able to help 50 to 60 people? Like you said, um, I guess each week or is it each day? I don't know. How are you able to keep them? Uh, it's every day, actually. And so we we have kind of com- a combined way. Our church uh, funds it in, in part. We use our, our facilities and uh, then we have partnerships with the Texas Food Bank and with uh, a number, a number of other community partners. We have a, a volunteers who serve in the ministry who are part of our church and, and folks who, who aren't that just uh, appreciate the mission and come in and, and love and serve uh, our neighbors uh, every day. You also mentioned that um, the particular church you're aligned with does things very differently. So how do you, and does your church do things differently than let's say, a, you know, a customary church or other churches that you've seen? Is it these additional projects beyond Sunday service or are there other elements that make it different? Well, I think it's a heart posture. So it's wanting our interior life to shape and mold our acts of service. And so healthy people um, create more healthy people and um, authentic people live authentic lives that are lives worth imitating. And so we, we first of all, focus on... Uh, being uh, spiritually and uh, even emotionally healthy in, in the way that we live our lives. And from that perspective, we serve. We proclaim uh, Jesus's resurrected life and that Jesus offers life to all who would come to him. And we, uh, at the same time, are able to sort of be about all, all kinds of other projects. And, and, I, and I just kind of think it's a it's a self-giving love that I experience in this particular congregation, but it's not limited to this congregation. There are lots of congregations around the country and around the world who do that. But I, I think at the same time, there's such a shift and changing of institutions that there are a lot of churches kind of holding on to what was. So they kind of put their heads in the sand, whereas we can boldly in this in this cultural moment kind of look outside of ourselves and go, OK, um, we we have to kind of speak to the world as it is, uh, which is what Jesus teaches us to do, as opposed to um, uh, wanting the world to be exactly like uh, it used to be or uh, we wish it would be. Um, of course, we want it to be a, a different, but we have to really uh, love and serve things as they are. So what do you think is necessary for a church to survive and thrive today versus maybe, you know, 20, 30 years ago? What's different about today? You started mentioning it now you have to meet people where they're at, but what does that mean in terms of what the church has to do in order to do well? 
Well, it, it's starting with what we have to offer the world and what we have to offer the world is a, a posture. I, I go back to this, this interior life, it's this kind of the peace that we have in God. So it's, an attitude of listening. So in my Fresh Expressions work, we, we, we do a lot of, you know, what in uh, community development would be called kind of asset mapping or asset-based community development. But, but as we kind of consider what assets we have to offer as a church or what assets we have within our community, we do that first and foremost from a, a posture of listening. Uh, we must listen uh, more than we talk. And I think, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, the church stood on a street corner and preached a sermon of without really listening to the needs of the community. And I think where we are now is much more, we've got to listen much more than we talk and understand our community and understand where people are and then come alongside those articulated needs because we have something to offer there. Um, the church is different than you know, a social service organization or you know, a, a charitable foundation. Uh, because we are uh, about meeting physical needs, but we're also about meeting spiritual needs. So listening, coming alongside, serving with others, uh, being confident in that is uh, really necessary for the day and age in which we find ourselves. And I, and I think once we, once we do that, we see people coming around the the idea of faith because they they experience belonging and then they start acting like a Christian. They are they start loving their neighbor. They start loving themselves. Uh, and we see uh, new ways of being church take shape out in the neighborhood, out in our homes, out in our uh, recreational activities. Those those kind. Of so, what what kind of activities have you seen really? seem to work well to bring the uh, the neighborhood and the church together or foster the health of the church versus ones that you know don't work as well or maybe you're um, you know backfire yeah again it's it's about self-giving it's not expecting everybody to show up and do what the church thinks they <laughs> thinks they should do i think in another age it was come on sunday fill the pews fill the offering plates and then we're church and and that that disciples people you know just about maybe 10 percent it gets, gets just barely gets their skin wet uh, in in the faith but but really going for it um in our neighborhoods and so you know one of the things that i've uh, is near and dear to my heart which is the subject of my book is this concept of how we bring church home so as Christians, we believe that our, our true home is found in God, but most of us um, are fortunate to live in homes. And so how can our homes be it, it kind of on ramps or ways to that ultimate home that we found, the ultimate home that we find in God? And so I've seen a lot of success where people use the strength of their home to renew the church and to renew the neighborhood at the same time. So if every Christian uh, can see their home as a little church, and we have thousands and thousands more churches than we realize, and those churches are often closer to the needs, they're closer to people, they're um, right there in the neighborhood. And so um, rather than just expecting everyone to show up in church at a given time, what if um, the church is engaged in equipping and sending all of our, our, our church people back to their little churches to be and tend the presence of Christ there. Well, what does that mean, bringing church home? What, what kind of things can people do in a concrete way yeah. to, to bring the church home to them? Absolutely. Well, I think it starts with, uh, again, like I said earlier, it starts with doing the dishes. So um, it starts by having and cultivating a healthy rhythm of life at home. So, you know, sometimes we lead, we lead really harried and frenetic lives. I wouldn't suggest people who are harried and frenetic try to impart that uh, harried way of life into others. But I would say, let's start with what we have and let's start by ordering our life around the presence of Christ at home. There are a lot of Christian mystics and others. Um, Brother Laurent is a Christian figure that comes to mind who talks about practicing the presence of Christ. So how are we practicing the presence of Christ when we get up in the morning, when we make a cup of coffee, when we do our dishes, our laundry, uh, go out to work or school? How are we practicing the presence of Christ? And if we get that kind of healthy rhythm of life 
and I, I'd even call it in my book, I, I talk about the liturgy of the home. So how, how, are our, uh, how is our home life kind of reflective of our worship life at church? So how do we impart the things that we learn at church into our home life? Then we have some kind of pattern or some kind of predictability that we want to impart uh, alongside others and we want to invite other people into. And so if our uh, home life has some kind of rhythm to it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It, it can be messy. I think people love to be invited into a home where there's a little bit of mess because they feel like, oh, well, that's that's easy. I can do that too because my home's. But if you, if you say have a, a a day a week, you know, for for me right now in our context, we you know our neighbors and I get together every other Friday, um, just after work, and we we play with the kids in the yard. We have some snacks and. Uh, you know, a couple of our neighbors come over and join us. And, you know, it's just about kind of building relationship with, with friends and neighbors. And um, you never know that those kind of relationships might uh, form into uh, a group of people that does more than have snacks together. Maybe we, we really learn how to care for, to share our possessions. We borrow lawnmowers, we borrow paint, we borrow whatever it is that, that we're doing in our everyday life. Uh, we share life together. And in the sharing of life together, I, as a Christian, I, you know, I want to always be up to invite Barry um, to say, I, I can only uh, live and breathe because of, uh, by the grace of God. And so I, I it's just a, a good challenge for everybody um, who, who is endeavoring to live a life in Christ out there to how can our lives be a reflection of Christ? How can our homes be, uh, as opposed to being like, okay, well, we've got another church activity, so let's get showered up, get ready, and and, and roll out and go to church where no one really see us. And Jesus said that uh, you will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another, and so we have to be able to show that love. That love has to be on display, and we're better than in our neighborhoods uh, and our homes um, to display that image of Christ. Well, what have you seen when people start to invite one another to their homes? I guess it, it, it helps build community, just one interaction or one small group at a time, if it happens on the regular. Is that, are there programs that, uh, that you have that, I don't know, maybe people don't know how to structure a home visit and they feel like they'll be awkward. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have any programming around that where you, you help people to have these, these home visits with one another and what to do? I do, and and I've, I've, a shameless self promotion for for the book, um, the book "Bringing Church Home: um, How the Family of God Makes Us a Little More Human." And you can pick it up on Amazon or at uh, FreshExpressions.com. In there, I outline kind of a way of gathering for folks who are interested in creating kind of a a way of being church at home that that is tethered to a historic a Christian tradition. I I, I get. A lot of uh, the the order that we've adapted actually was adapted from Roman Catholics. So I, I kind of figure if the kind of historic Catholic uh, way of being Christian shape uh, all of, of the church, so so be it. And so in in the book, we kind of we do we outline a way of, of being church. We also outline, uh, like I, I said earlier, the kind of the how you can develop patterns of life. Um, and I'm a uh, offer from time to time, and I'll, I'll start one, I think, September the 23rd, but a, a course that I offer through Fresh Expressions. You can go to freshexpressions.com, and we do something called the Resilient Church Account Quarter, and I'll have a, a little course. It's a, a three-part course on how to bring church home for the audiences, uh, for the audience to, to digest and chew on. Well, what have you noticed um, if, if church is done, quote, unquote, right? I mean, you mentioned one neighborhood. I don't know where, but it's okay. You mentioned one neighborhood that really wasn't doing well, but the church still is out there trying to minister to people. How much of a role do churches play in, in maintaining a neighborhood, not letting it fall apart? Um, I know they, maybe they can't stop it on their own, but what does that dynamic look like? I, that's a really wonderful question. And I, and I think in our uh, context, and again, I've only been in our, our church context for a very, very, very short uh, but this church uh, was a large, prominent church in a large and prominent neighborhood that was affected by just the egregious nature of white flight and uh, debate about school integration in Dallas, Texas. And, and a lot of folks uh, moved out of the neighborhood and the church had an opportunity at one point to move out of the neighborhood and decided not to. And so they went through 
uh, several decades of neighborhood decline and, and stayed and served a neighbor, the neighborhood anyway, which is why our homeless ministry, it's called Mission Oak Cliff. And Mission Oak Cliff was uh, started uh, to serve the needs that are, arose during that time. And you know, now fast forward 30, 40 years, the neighborhood is, is gentrifying in, in, in many respects. And so we kind of are living in this tension of kind of what is and what was and what, what is coming now. And, and so holding all these things in tension. So serving the needs of the poor, but then also serving the needs of a budding art community uh, at the same time. And, and so um, I think, you know, churches, uh, Stanley Hauerwas, who is one of my teachers, uh, says that the purpose of the church is to show the world that it is not the church. So there's this uh, way of being church that that points people to a different way of life, a different way of living, a different kind of time, a time, again, that is that is not hurried, but a time that is reflected, a time that is anticipating the inbreaking of, of the kingdom of God. And that's that's what the church is designed to do, and, and the churches um, who can look outside of themselves and, and get on with that, uh, I th- I think the church is a vital uh, component of of a neighborhood revitalization and uh, caring uh, for the neighborhood. So, is there a curriculum or a set of guidelines that you've developed that works better than just? randomly trying to do whatever you can do to figure stuff out, you know, without guidance. Like what, what have you, what have you taken away from, I don't want to call them experiments, but the activities that, uh, that you've done through the church you work with, uh, what has worked and what hasn't any, any quick tips uh, that you can give to listeners. I am absolutely okay. Calling it, ex- calling these experiments. Um, we've got to be in, a, in an age of experimentation. Um, a, a, a lot of the folks that I work with uh, uh, ex- experiment with a leadership concept called adaptive leadership. Um, so adaptive change, adaptive challenges, how are we adapting to what is? Uh, the pandemic required this of all of us. Uh, you know, any anyone in any position of institutional leadership, I don't care if it was government or uh, school, church, in business, we were all adapting basically on the day? Are we at work today? Are we uh, changing the schedule today? Um, what is what is the, the rhythm of testing for uh, COVID-19? Whatever it is, um, we've had to live in an adaptive space. And so I, I at, as horrible as the pandemic is, um, I want us to be able to take some of those adaptive challenges into the rest of our life, into the the years that we're <laughs> got remaining on the earth to really live in a, a spirit of experimentation. So I think that's a, a key marker of being willing to experiment, try things, and then reflect and iterate on, on these. So there's just a lot of uh, information out there. I mentioned asset-based community development, I mentioned adaptive leadership, and fresh expressions. Once again, we start, we kind of have this journey that we take people on through our tools and training of teaching people how to listen and then love and serve other community, which again is coming alongside the, the um, articulated needs in the community, as opposed to people in a church sitting around uh, with a, a, a pen and paper in hand, assuming that they know the needs of the community. We've got to actually get out and, and understand what the needs are, which is why I say our youth are out, you know, we're getting to know business owners. And then, you know, building community and then, uh, you know, daring to ask the question, could church, a way of being church, take shape in the neighborhood that is um, every bit as valid as the beautiful neo-Gothic space that we inhabit on Sunday mornings um, out in the neighborhood for people who who might not be found uh, in any other church. So Fresh Expressions provides great training and tools to invite people to kind of uh, consider uh, and look at resources on adaptive leadership and asset-based community development. But yeah. How have you seen, uh, you know, the neighborhood respond to some of your efforts? And what did that tell you about uh, what you're trying to do? I think, um, say something like our mission of the homeless um, is, again, meeting a concrete need that regular everyday people understand. And so... um, the more that the church can be about uh, loving and serving the needs of the community that the community actually understands, the more, I think, I'm trying to find the right word, but the more interested 
the less uh, barriers uh, are put up um, when people see a living demonstration of, say, the kingdom of God at work, they're more interested in it. But when it's kind of just all done behind closed doors, you know, for an hour on Sunday, you know, it's just hard. It's hard to have any kind of visual sign of that. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Well, very good, Dennis. Um, can you restate the name of your book and tell sure. people where to get it? And then I want to ask people, um, you know, if they wish to reach out to you, uh, how can they find you? Sure. You can find me at Gannon, G-A-N-N-O-N dot stems at freshexpressions.com. You can find the book, Bringing Church Home, How the Family of God Makes Us a Little More Human, uh, over on Amazon or also at freshexpressions.com. And uh, I do a word of, of thanks to our publisher, Seedbed. You can find uh, the book also at seedbed.com. So uh, thanks uh, to you and uh, for your interest. And um, I look forward to continued conversation. Yeah, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at the good question podcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit the good question podcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast.